This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 403. Hi, I'm Stephen M. R. Covey, the author of the New York Times and number one Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything. Shift your professional growth into high gear every time you listen to this. It's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. When you're in your 20s, life can seem full of obstacles. Where's that glorious career you dreamed of? How can you make your way past student debt, economic uncertainty, and other challenges of adulting? Well, today I want to encourage you to be inspired by 25 fascinating and diverse profiles of iconic men and women that show where they were at near the age of 25 and how they built their legacies across a range of careers, including the arts, business, science, and government. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast and our final episode of 2021. Read to Lead is the podcast designed to not only help you narrow your reading list, but bring you key insights and valuable ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors and their books. Our guest today includes prolific author Robert L. Dylan Schneider. He's author of a brand new book called Nailing It, How History's Awesome 20-somethings got it together. I'll be asking Robert to share how he went about deciding who to include in a book like this, what he found to be some of the common threads among his subjects, the importance of things like taking calculated risks when it comes to reaching your goals, and lots more. Since releasing my own book earlier this year called Read to Lead, The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career, I've had the chance to speak to employees at some pretty amazing companies and provide some unique training in and around establishing effective reading habits and improving things like comprehension, retention, and lots more. Some of the folks I've had the chance to get in front of include employees at places like LinkedIn, Disney, companies like Docket, and Anvil and soon the Virginia Council of CEOs, and much more. If I can help bring some of these same skills to your team, I would love the opportunity to do that. The best way to start the conversation is over email. I hope you'll reach out to me, jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. That's jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. And you can find out more about my book, by the way, at readtoleadbook.com. That's readtoleadbook.com. Robert Dylan Schneider started in public relations in 1967 in New York. I was but a wee lad. Uh, he would go on to become president and chief executive officer of Hill and Knowlton, Inc., and would eventually form his own firm, the Dylan Schneider Group, in 1991. Uh, the firm provides strategic advice and counsel to Fortune 500 companies and leading families and individuals around the world with experience in fields ranging from mergers and acquisitions and crisis communications to marketing, government affairs, and international media. He's the author of numerous books, 14, I believe, at last count. His latest, a book I'm loving, is called Nailing It, How History's Awesome 20-somethings Got It Together. Robert, welcome officially to the Read to Lead podcast. Jeff, it's fantastic to be on the show, and you've got a wonderful uh, franchise, so I'm really blessed that you took the time to include me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to have you here. And I am a lover of a good biography. And when I sat down to read your book, it's it's like reading 25 mini biographies, <laughs> which is just a real, real treat for me. Robert, talk a bit about what drove you to write this book, your message to young people that despite what they may feel is a useless degree or career opportunities that have fallen apart before the journey's begun, that there is still hope. I try to be a student of the human condition, Jeff. And uh, my view, maybe I'm just an old guy, is that life and society is not going in the right direction. Mm. It's going south. And some of the polls show that uh, in terms of the United States, but also other parts of the world. So can people my age, forgive me, your age, turn this around? Uh, They might be able to, but the people that are really going to turn it around are young people. Mm. And people who are in their late teens, early 20s, maybe even up to 30. They're the people who are going to really make a difference. And so I wanted to show those people through the little vignettes we created, uh, that there is a way for them. Put their head down, drive toward the finish line, and they can be very successful. So every single one of the vignettes is aimed at doing that. And uh, it's aimed at saying, here's a person who was a nobody in the beginning of his or her life who um, became a really significant person, and here's how they did it. And so I hope that young people listening to this podcast will say to themselves, I can do that. And now I have to figure out my own course going forward, and maybe I'll be in 
Ronan Dillerschneider's next next book. <laughs> and some of those people on that list: uh, Mozart, Grant, Einstein, uh, Helen Keller, Coco Chanel, Maya Angelou. And, and others, who were some of your favorite subjects that you featured? I know that may be asking you to like pick who your favorite child or grandchild is, but who would you say are some of your favorite subjects from the book? Well, I, I knew some of these people firsthand, and I'll tell you about one of them in a second. It's an answer to your question, but uh, of all the people that are in the book, I think uh, Domier is a guy I really liked a lot. He uh, was is French, was French. Lithographer, right? A lithographer. I think he was an artist. Mm. But uh, the French establishment didn't accept it. And they said, he's just an illustrator. Uh, I have a lot of domiers in my house because it was timely and topical. Oh, wow. And uh, I really thought the guy was fantastic. And he kind of stood up. And in France, as you know, if uh, if you're not on the inside, it's pretty withering. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so a domier did it. Anyhow, the person that I really kind of relate to in the book, there are a number of them, but is I am Pei, the architect. And Pei may be, he's still alive, but he may have been in his day uh, the best architect in the world. Really quite fantastic. And he did did remarkable things. And I remember in particular when he did the triangle in front of the Louvre in Paris. I'll never forget this. He had done the design. He put it in place. And the design wasn't just the triangle. It was the things under the triangle. It was the things that really made it work. Mm. And we went over to Paris and we had a meeting with uh, Francois Mitterrand and uh, Jacques Chirac. So the four of us were in the meeting. Chirac was at that point the uh, mayor of Paris. Later on was the uh, prime minister. Wow. And Pei presented the program for the Louvre, which is a national treasure over there. Uh, you've been to the Louvre, you know, and many people listening to this have been to the Louvre, so they know what it's like. Mm. Well, Mitterrand immediately said, there's no way we're going to do this. Uh, it's not in keeping with the Louvre tradition. It's not in keeping with what we do in Paris. At which point, Jacques Chirac uh, stood up, and as only the mayor of Paris and Chirac could do, said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we have to do this. And the Prime Minister was taken aback, and I saw Pei starting to feel really good about this <laughs> because he had been rejected minutes mm-hmm. before. And Chirac said, we have to do this because it's the meeting of the French people to uh, do things different, to push the edge of the envelope, and to come up with new ideas. And that, by the way, is true mm-hmm. over the uh, course of the years. So Mitterrand mm-hmm. said, okay. <clears throat> and we started the construction. And it was so important to pay, who had a version of practice uh, in New York uh, and was very active in other parts of the world. He supervised a lot of the work himself. He wanted to be sure it was just down to the T. Well, mm. seeing in him, he, pay, pay, pay was, a, was a wonderful man. And he has a great sense of humor. And he's as smart as can be. But mm. if something is not done well, uh, pay gives it attention. And you know, if you've done, not done anything well, you're not on Pei's good side. So he was literally there when they were laying the bricks and putting the glass in place. And if it wasn't done correctly, he would get up out of his chair and go over and say, you got to ch- you got to change this. Mm. In the beginning, the French tradesmen uh, didn't like it. And they said, oh, we're just going to do this. And this is the way. And Pei said, we're not doing it that way. And there were many, many standoffs mm. uh, in, the, uh, in the Tuileries garden uh, over what was done. So Pei was my... Uh, uh, my uh, my real hero. Mm. There's a building in Boston, Angot Tower, that uh, Pei designed. 67 stories, very famous. And it's, a, on the, it's an iconic on the, mm. on the uh, landscape of Boston. Anyhow, uh, the windows started falling out of the building at the very top, and it was kind of scary. Mm. And I remember being up there one day, and uh, we were kind of bravely saying, well, nothing's going to happen here. The secretaries were doing what they did. The executives were doing what they did. I was going back and forth between the chairs. And all of a sudden, two windows popped out of 60, 67 floors up. That was pretty terrifying. Wow. Uh, thank God it wasn't a windstorm. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, uh, uh, this was a pay project. Mm-hmm. But Harry Cobb, COBB, who is absolutely brilliant. I mean, Harry Cobb is really something. Uh, Harry Cobb did the design work for the project. And pay as the project had more and more difficulty, used to say, Bob, make sure Harry gets the uh, gets the attention on this. <laughs> so Harry Cobb is known for that. Mm. But I remember being one time in Coral Gables, Florida, and it was midnight. This is more than you want to know, but it was midnight. And uh, my phone rang. And, you know, the phone rings midnight anywhere. You're kind of concerned about what it is. Sure. <clears throat> it was pay. And uh, pay said, Robert, he used to always refer to me as Robert. He said, uh, I have a serious problem. I said, what is it? And he said, People Magazine wants to feature me on the cover with Jackie Kennedy. And I said, well, I am. That's not going to help you. 
people that uh, read People magazine are not going to give you commissions. It's not going to happen. And I said, and besides, that's just pure celebrity. I know you won't can't do it. Mm. At which point, Pace said, but it's Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, I said, uh, you know, her handlers are going to work very hard to make sure she gets prominence on the cover. Mm. At which point, Pace said to me, it was my job to make sure he got prominence <laughs> on the cover. So we did a lot of talking back and forth with the editors of People. And we generally agreed to a position where Pay and Jackie Kennedy each got 50% mm. of the cover. I consider that a huge triumph. Mm. They consider it a disaster and a defeat. He won 75%. <laughs> Anyhow, he, he really is kind of a special, special person. But there are other people. I mean, I never met Helen Keller, but mm. my God, what a story. Yeah. And uh, as smart as a whip, obviously. Mm. But uh, she had terrible frailties with her sight and other factors. She overcame those and, uh, and turned out to be quite a significant person on the American and global landscape. And I think that's pretty terrific. I really applaud that. Well, related to, to my last question, Robert, how did you go about deciding who to feature in the book in the first place? I would imagine you had a bit of a, a, bit of a long list you had to whittle down or, or no. No, we had hundreds and there are many that are not in the book. Maybe the editors will ask me to do a second book. I hope so. And, uh, but uh, we decided that we wanted people from different walks of life in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, mm. who would uh, be possible as, uh, to be profiled. So that's how we got to where we were. Mm. Uh, there were huge fights about uh, this person and that person not being in the book. But uh, Jack Welsh, for example, uh, was the guy that really grew General Electric. I wanted Jack, who I knew very well, in the book in the worst way. The editors didn't want him in the book. Mm. They said he's just a commercial businessman. Well, he built one of the great colossuses of all time, which, as we know from recent days, is now going to be split mm. into three. If Jack were alive, he would be very unhappy with that. But, uh, mm. but he's not. And uh, so what he did created so much money for so many people, so many different products and services, such an effort to really improve the quality of life. The thing I liked about Jack, and again, he's not in the book, but whenever Jack decided to do something, he always said to those around him, well, how's this going to help people? What's this going to do for people? And uh, more often than not, uh, it wasn't going to do much, so we didn't do it. Uh, but mm -hmm. Jack did a lot for a lot of people and uh, pretty, pretty terrific guy. And a sense of humor that was incredible. I have been a New York Yankee fan all my life. Jack was a Boston Red Sox fan, and he would mail me Red Sox caps <laughs> Red Sox shirts, Red Sox socks. And uh, whenever I went there, I would wear a Red Sox ball cap. So oh. it, was, uh, it was that kind of relationship. <laughs> well, what did you find to then be some of the, of the common threads of, of those that you, that you did include? Uh, I'm sure there were, were many. Uh, the common thread really is determination. It's people saying, I'm going to do that and, uh, and not yeah. giving up. And people recognizing that if you Try it and you fail and try it and you fail and try it. Eventually you'll succeed. And that was the common thread that uh, really mm -hmm. marked everybody. The second common thread was people finding themselves in situations that gave them the opportunity to excel. U.S. Grant is a good example of this. Ulysses S. Grant, he was just a general. He was nothing, but he had the opportunity to excel and he did it. And uh, so, but when Grant prepared himself in the morning, he probably said to himself, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a big part of what defines the people in the book. Mm -hmm. And I hope that readers of the book, people listening to the show, will say to themselves, I can do it. Uh, I'm just like these other guys. I just have to figure out a way to do it. And when, in figuring out the way to do it, that's where the real creativity is involved. So uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of the defining, the defining moment. I remember, uh, again, back to uh, Mozart, who leads the book, by the way. Uh, I mean, Mozart's music is just, there's, no, there's nobody like him. And I certainly didn't know Mozart, but I knew a lot of Mozart people. So we're in Vienna about two or three years ago, and it's the evening. And I said to my sons, let's go out and have dinner and go to the Mozart Festival. I said, who's Mozart? And I said, I then described who Mozart was, at which point they said, oh, he's not a, a shock jock. He's not uh, doing popular music. He's not this. He's not that. I said, look, for your dad, let's go hear Mozart, which mm. we did. They came out of there loving Mozart mm. and loving the, loving the music. 
Yeah. I studied classical music in college. I'm a huge fan of, of Mozart and his work. I played French horn. Oh. And so, yeah, Mo- Mozart and I were pretty tight back in the day. <laughs> uh, Robert, I would argue that the reason most of the world is full of, uh, to use your words, timid souls and, and idle dreamers who never really go after what they want uh, is because of the risk involved and the fear associated with taking that risk. Taking risk moves me outside my comfort zone, right? Uh, uh, what's your advice? to someone who wants to avoid getting to the end of their life with regret for risks they didn't take? Uh, No one wants to fail. And uh, I think a lot of people every day get up and they say, if I try this, which they don't try, it might fail and would hurt me. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's a smart thing to do. I think the key thing for people who want to really make a difference is to say to themselves, well, here's a goal I have. And here are the five things I need to do to reach that goal. And I'm going to get one done, not five, and I'm going to celebrate that. <laughs> and I'm going to get two done, and I'm going to celebrate that. And eventually I'll get to five, and I'll get to my goal. A lot of people don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's a way to at least think about it. I do think that in the current life we have here in the United States and around the world, there should be no shortage of goals. I mean, we just passed in the United States this infrastructure bill. My God, I mean, the amount of repair that has to be done to the infrastructure in the United States is staggering. And within that little task are millions of jobs of men and women who can make a huge difference. So uh, I'm quite excited about that part of the infrastructure. But there are certain parts I don't like, but that part I do like. <laughs> hey, what might surprise uh, most people, you think, uh, about a young Albert Einstein? Einstein uh, began as kind of a clerk, and he worked at a uh, post office situation. There was nothing there for him. And uh, I think a lot of people just treated him as a clerk. At one point, Einstein just kind of sucked it up and uh, in his private moment said, look, I can really change things. And he stepped out and did it. And I think the stuff that's not in the book, unfortunately, because it was a matter of space, the number of people who reached out and helped Einstein, once they saw what was possible, they pushed him along the way. Einstein, very smart, never gave up the whole equation. No one person that helped him ever understood totally Mm. what the the equation was. Very smart for Einstein. Uh, uh, But that's what got him going. That's what got him out of the post office. And that's what started things along the way. The guy, again, absolutely brilliant. I believe for many young men and women, a real model for what to do and how to do it. Mm. I think the Swiss postal system, which is where he worked, uh, doesn't really talk about him much. They should. I mean, he was there. He did fantastic work as a post postman. But um, Mm. Uh, he's known for other things, obviously. You know, more than one of your subjects, as I read through the book, seemed to connect with a mate that at least one of their parents didn't approve of. <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, Mozart's father uh, and, and his opinion of, of Mozart's eventual bride. And, uh, and then there's Mary Shelley and her family, her father in particular, who didn't approve of her affair. Did you find that there's often a rebellious streak in history's change makers? And is that word I'm using uh, a fair description of, of those two I just mentioned? I think in terms of history's change makers, these are men and women who put their head down and went for the finish line. And they discarded things on the right and things that were the left. And they kept going straight ahead. Mm. That offends a lot of people. And it makes a lot of people with a strong sense of annoyance. So I think that's what people who want to succeed really have to do. They have to say, look, here's my objective. Here are these seven things I need to do to achieve the objective. And I'm not taking advice from anybody who tells me to do something other than the seven. Mm-hmm. But I am going to do the seven. And then I think as they do the seven and they sense uh, achievement, success on one of the seven, they need to find ways to celebrate it. I mean, whether it's going out and having a good dinner, uh, getting an award, any virtual kind of way to do it, but it's something to celebrate that they did it and then feel good about themselves. Mm. That will drive them to the next uh, part of their success. Uh, Coco Chanel was a good example of this. Uh, I mean, Coco Chanel came from pretty modest beginnings and was frankly a, uh, a lady of the night. Yeah. And uh, she was pretty effective, but she all of a sudden figured out that fragrance made a difference. Mm-hmm. And she did this in Montmartre outside Paris. And the Parisians in the beginning, they didn't care about it. They discarded Chanel. Well, she put her head down, put her shoulder to the wheel and built up one heck of a company. Her company was uh, on the Rue Cambon, which is uh, just 
adjacent to the Ritz Hotel. And she would frequently come in the Ritz by the back door because he's, she was so well known. Uh, Coco Chanel is the person who overcame tremendous hurdles, tremendous hurdles mm. to create the brand that uh, she did. Uh, I think this happens to a lot of people. And I think it's very sad. Uh, Coco Chanel sold out. And uh, like many others, Louis Vuitton, Cartier, they all sold out. And uh, they sold out to people with lots of money who made more money from them, but uh, who really did not do much for the brand or for the vision that these people had. I think that's an unfortunate thing that happens a lot of times. Mm. So I say to everybody listening to the podcast, don't give up too early. And if you are going to give up, make sure you, you do two things. One is you get a lot, but make sure that you're going to stay in the game somehow. So that the vision and the attitude that you've really stimulated stick around. You know, no, no book on, on history's awesome 20 somethings would be complete without a chapter. I, I think on Steve Jobs, who at 25 was a millionaire several times over. And in that chapter on jobs, uh, you mentioned that you know all of us are unique, and that's not necessarily you admit anything uh, revelatory. Uh, but you asked the question: Are we willing to live as if we know it? Uh, why must that question, in your mind, be front and center for for all of us? Life deals hands to everybody, and frequently the hands are not the best hand of all. Mm. And I think you have to look at your cards and say, "I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this uh, two pair into a full house." <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Uh, Jobs was a difficult man. Uh, in fact, a very difficult man. The people working with Jobs, I think, you know, shook their head. But hmm. Jobs' vision was so powerful that those working with him said, uh, we're going to stop our anxiety for our own situations, and we're going to help Steve Jobs. There's a very interesting man who uh, worked for Microsoft, and he was considered for the book, and no one knows who he was. His name is Nathan Berhold. Nathan Merville was the guy that made Microsoft what it is, not mm -hmm. Bill Gates, Nathan Merville. And I said to Merville a number of years ago, Bill, Bill Gates is getting all the money, Nathan. And Merville said, I don't care. He said, I had the idea, and it's affected millions. Mm -hmm. And I and my family know that. And he said, people that know me know I do it. And he said, I don't care about the rest. So, again, there's a self-abasing quality mm -hmm. that a lot of people who are very successful have, and I think that's, again, a real positive. Hmm. Well, I got a couple of questions I want to ask uh, with regard to uh, some of your personal habits. It's a question I've begun asking all my guests. Uh, before I do that, uh, Robert, anything else from the book you want to make sure that we, we know about? I just think if somebody has a chance to look at the book, try to apply the lessons to your life. Hmm. Because are the people we I read about in the book important? Sure, they are. But I think that the reader is really important. And if he can say to himself or herself, I can do this. Ulysses has granted this. Coco Chanel did this. I am paid in this. We're going to get uh, something pretty good coming out. Mm. The second part of that is this. There is enormous competition right now in the United States and for the United States around the world. There's an opportunity right now to make a positive difference, not to be negative, not to be a person who cares a lot about money, but to be a, to be a person that cares about something that really moves the ball forward. We are very anxious about China these days in the United mm. States. Fact is. The Chinese have really moved the ball forward very dramatically. And they've done it because they've had their heads down. And let's hope we can find a way to, to build a bridge to them. On the, side, on the other side of the game, we have the Russians, who have an extremely important history. I mean, the number of people in the arts who flourished in Russia was unbelievable. But unfortunately, the Russian system doesn't allow for people who did that to... Uh, uh, to, 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 to prosper. Any of you who have been to St. Petersburg, I think we'll walk away with it. Just a fantastic feeling, far different from Moscow, on what the Russians were able to do. But unfortunately, it's, uh, their society hasn't moved as the Chinese society mm. has moved. So the Japanese did this before. It's up to America now, to, which we did, by the way, uh, right after the Second World War. It's up to America to take the next giant step forward. And leaders in America young men and women are going to have to get in the train and drive it. That's what's going to happen. I hope that's helpful. It is. Yeah. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, once said, do one thing every day that scares you. Uh, I'm a big believer in that uh, successful people, people who realize their biggest dreams and highest priorities, which is how I generally define it. 
understand the value of dancing with discomfort, I like to call it. I wonder if you can give us an example, Robert, of how you attempt to, to step outside your comfort zone on occasion. Right. What would, would be an example of that? I, I try as hard as I can to stay within my comfort zone because <laughs> I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, occasionally I have to take a step forward, maybe every day. Mm. And so I, I, I try to do that. Uh, yesterday is a good example. I was in my comfort zone. I was really relaxing, you know, just really enjoying life. And uh, someone came by and asked me to do something. And it was a pretty significant thing. Mm. And I said, well, if I do this, I'm going to really expose myself to uh, criticism, perhaps. And, uh, uh, but I didn't. And uh, right now, it's worked out pretty well. Maybe it'll be critiqued in the next week or so. But I went outside my comfort zone to do it. And I did it because I saw the benefits that would come from doing it. Not just benefits to society, but benefits for me personally. I knew if I did it, I'd grow. Mm. And uh, I want I wanted always to be in a position where I could grow. Mm. Uh, another habit, and this is uh, uh, not surprisingly a favorite of mine, of successful people, is a consistent reading habit. They ritualize reading, I like to say. Uh, what do you do, if anything, Robert, to ensure that you spend time reading on, on a regular basis? This is a huge issue. We have television and the internet make it uh, even more difficult. Mm. Uh, but I think sitting back and saying, okay, I'm going to read now is very, very important. Just blocking out a period of time when you're going to do it is very important. I think that the uh, it's too easy to sit in the armchair and watch TV and have it done for you. Mm. I think the idea of reading something and saying, hey, that's, this, is a, this applies to me and I can do something here is pretty good. I think that we should all have on our list the two or three books that we want to read. Uh, I always try to read the Council on Foreign Relations uh, magazine, Foreign Affairs, mm. because it says so much about what's going on in the world. Is it an easy read? No, not at all. <laughs> That's a very difficult read. But generally within the read, there are nuggets that apply. I used to work with a guy named James Patterson, who was a best-selling author. Mm -hmm. And Patterson came into my office one day many years ago, and he said, look, I don't like this work at all. I'm mm. going to start writing novels. And I said, Jimmy, you can't do that. And he said, I can. And I said, you've never written a novel before. And he said, it's in my head. <laughs> so we went down that afternoon, I'll never forget this, to a bar on Third Avenue in New York City called Stratagans. Stratagans is gone now. And we sat at the bar drinking Boilermakers. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you had a Boilermaker in the past or mm -hmm. your listeners have had one, but you don't want to have too many. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, we're drinking Boilermakers. And Patterson said, what do you think the success is going to be? And I said, number one, Short chapters, people that can read two or three pages of a chapter and they feel they feel fulfilled. Mm. Uh, number two, make sure there's some action in the chapter that uh, people can relate to. And he wrote the book without mind. Every chapter has those things in mind. Mm. And if you pick up a Patterson book and you say, "God, this is ninety chapters," it's really not ninety chapters. <laughs> it's not 90, ninety little vignettes, and you can read it over time. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, another habit, I uh, just got uh, three more I want to ask you about, uh, is what I call examining your energy. This is uh, uh, most successful people's tendency to evaluate what they do and what they don't do uh, through the lens of energy. Uh, I'm curious to know what steps do you take to increase the amount of time you spend in areas that give you energy, Robert, and lessen the amount of time you spend in areas that maybe zap your energy? Well, for probably the last six months, I've been working out with a trainer called Nick. I don't know Nick's last name, but he's a great trainer. <laughs> and Nick gets me to do a thing called sit stands, which are very difficult. <laughs> You're sitting in your chair, you just stand up to attention, sit back down. You try to do that seven or eight times. It's pretty tough. Anyhow, in the course of all of this, Nick and I will talk about things that have nothing to do with training, but have everything to do with life and how things should be portrayed and addressed. Mm. And that's extremely helpful to me because I use that energy generation time to say to myself, okay, I'm going to try to do this. Mm. Nick leaves and uh, occasionally I'll slip back and not do it. But more than, more than, more than occasion, I'll actually try to do something we talked about. That's a positive. Mm. Uh, the next one, assemble your advisors. Assuming you attempt to connect regularly with like-minded people who maybe encourage you or challenge you or help hold you accountable, in what ways does that tend to manifest itself for you? What does that look like? I think, first of all, having a set of advisors is very important. And uh, 
I have many people I count on, I mean, literally dozens. Mm. And the way I get them to offer their opinions is to ask them a question. And by answering the question, they then give me not just the answer to the question, they give me more. Mm. And that adds to my life. So if I can do that once or twice a day, that's all. It really brings a quotient to what I do that uh, is quite extraordinary. The advisors that I have range from people in the arts, uh, people in the uh, in religion, people who are in education, mm. some business people, not too many, people in the physical aspects of life, very, very good people. And these people are people who want to talk. If you ask them, mm-hmm. they want to tell you their story. Mm. So ask them, get their opinion, draw them out. And in doing so, you'll find out something that will be important to you. Mm. Love that. The last one, uh, master your mornings. How important to you, Robert, is a consistent morning ritual? Uh, and, and how do your mornings tend to, to unfold? I wish I had a morning ritual. I probably do. <laughs> I uh, think very hard in the night. I have to go up with ideas in the middle of the night that I can't remember in the morning. Uh-huh. Uh, I think a lot of people have this issue. And so one of the things I've tried to do is when I come up with an idea, I try to write it down. That's very difficult because you have to have light to write things down. <laughs> and my wife doesn't really enjoy that. And I've tried to explain to her that I'm trying to do something here. But in getting up in the morning, it's very important for me, first thing, to have a, a, a glass of water just to really start the day. Mm. And it's very important to me to, now I do it. I used to read the papers every morning. I still do. But it's very important to me to go on the internet and see what I've missed overnight. Mm. And I generally go to Associated Press News of the Day, go to Bloomberg News of the Day, figure out what's going on, try to put myself in the picture. Then I go to the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Mm. the uh, Christian Science Monitor, uh, and other publications. And I read the editorials. These are smart people Mm. who got opinions. I don't agree with them most of the time. (laughs) <laughs> but they're worth reading. Right. And they, uh, they add a dimension to, uh, to what I try to do. So that's something I try to do mm-hmm. all the time. The final thing I try to do every morning, every morning, is I try to call a woman named Joan of Agliano, who has worked with me for more than 30 years. Mm-hmm. And Joan of Agliano keeps me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> and I'll say, Joan, what you, what's going on? And she'll say, well, you have to do these three things today. And oftentimes, I've forgotten what the three things are, but Joan reminds me and we get it done. <laughs> she is an invaluable person and really tremendous in terms of whatever success I've had. We all need a Joan of Agliano. Yeah. And I, I know when I build my days and look at my days and my weeks, I, I try to identify, as, as you just suggested, you know, what are, what are the big three? What are the three main things I need to get done today such that if I only got those three things done, today would be successful. That's it. Well, this has been a real treat. Uh, Robert's book, again, is called Nailing It, How History's Awesome 20-somethings Got It Together. Uh, Robert, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate having you and sharing uh, all your experiences. It's been terrific on the show, and I now understand why the show is entitled Read the Lead. I mean, this is a fantastic show. A lot of people take a lot of comfort from it, and you do fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And there you have it. It's official. Four calendar years of uninterrupted Read to Lead podcast episodes. 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Let's keep it going, shall we? We'll do that next week. In fact, with episode 404. In that episode, I'll welcome author Paul Maltby, who's written a book called The Fearless Facilitator, a proven plan for leading successful meetings, dynamic workshops, and effective training events. And this book has already helped me improve in all of those areas. I think you'll love it. That's next week on the Read to Lead podcast, the first episode of 2022. Hey, I hope you'll reach out to me directly if I can help you and your team with personal and professional development training. The best way to reach me is jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. And again, to find out more on my book, readtoleadbook.com. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time, next year, for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.